meeting you again uh, on, on our topic dealing with true character. Um, do my best this morning not to keep you long. Uh, we have a busy afternoon, um, I think. Praise the Lord. I'd uh, like us to turn to uh, John 1.12. Uh, you probably know the verse anyway, or Acts 1 verse 8. Um, but I think John 1.12 says something along the lines that as many as received him gave he power to become the sons of God. Is that about right? And, and then over in Acts 1, 8 it says what? But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Samaria, Judea, Samaria, unto the uttermost parts of the world. Does it say that? Or something along those lines. It just saves me finding it and reading it for myself. I'm just trusting that you will witness that it, it says something along those lines. Now what's important there, of course, we're dealing with new birth, being born again. Amen? Um, we're dealing with, um, and I'm going to make a statement uh, shortly, uh, but in the very moment when you are born again, you enter that new and living way. In, in that very instant, amen, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are new. Amen. See, in that instant, you are born again. At that very moment, you enter the new and living way. The Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, enjoins himself to you. Amen. He joins himself with you. Amen. Uh, and and, and uh, in the literal but yet spiritual way, you become bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. Not in the literal sense, but certainly in the spiritual sense. We just read those two verses, especially the first one there, that when you receive him, did you receive him? Did you invite him? Did you allow him to come into your life? Well, that present moment, you became the son or daughter of God. Amen? And praise God for that. Amen? You became an actual son, an actual daughter of God. Hallelujah. Amen? And of course, at that very moment, when you are born again, you are made a partaker. You are made a partaker of the divine nature. And, and I find that... Um, uh, wonderful, uh, and I also find that uh, that it's something that's easy to say, but very few people understand what it actually means and what it actually does for you, amen? You see, in that moment when you are born again, you are truthful. In that very moment, you are righteous. In that very moment when you are born again, when you become a partaker of the divine nature, uh, you are faithful. Amen? You are not becoming truthful. You are not becoming righteous. You are certainly not becoming faithful. You are. At that very moment of new birth. And you can go back to that moment if you remember the moment. If you remember the time, if you remember the place, and maybe you can recollect or, 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 or um, uh, just get that memory way back there, and at that very moment, you became a partaker. You were made a partaker of the divine nature. In that very present moment, you were truthful, you were righteous, and you were faithful. In fact, you at that very moment were made into the image of God. Amen? Isn't that just wonderful? Amen? Turn, turn, turn with me to Romans chapter 8. Let's read a few verses. And, and then I want to share with you something about my own journey to help you understand what it is to become a partaker of the divine nature in the moment when you are born again. In Romans 8 verse 14 says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. You know, some people argue about whether we are uh, true sons or we are simply hiding behind the, 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 the skirt tails of Jesus Christ. 
You know, when you go to a lot of these churches, whether it be the Baptist church, Pentecostal churches, they're always talking about that Jesus Christ is your big, uh, your big brother, and He's always standing there for you in your place. But that's just not true. You stand in your place. And praise God because according to the Scriptures, you are the Son of God. You are the daughter of God. And it, that's plain and simple, isn't it? Amen. It says, For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby, or the reason why, you can now cry out, Abba Father. You now cry out and say that God is your Father. Amen. You know, there's a big difference between having God and having a Father. And, uh, amen, Paul is trying to bring out that the true God, the true and living God is as a father to you. Amen? And on that basis, you are his true son. You are his true daughter. He goes on to say, uh, next verse, the spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Hallelujah. Amen? When we are born again in that moment, God remakes us. I believe that God recreates us. He doesn't re recreate us on the outside, although I believe He does a work there as well. But in that very moment, on the inside of you, a new being is born. And you've got to believe that. I mean, in that moment, that old being, amen, passes away, and in its place is a new recreated you. And that new recreated you at that very instant is truthful, is righteous, and is faithful. Amen? Amen? You see, again, you know, Paul said, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. He said, old things are passed. He didn't say past. He said, are passed away. And when something is passed away, it means it is dead. True? You see, a lot of people just think it's past. When something is past, it can come back. But when it's passed away, it means it is dead. You see, your old nature, you've got to understand this, and you, you have to live like this. Your old nature is dead. Your old character is dead. When you are born again, you no longer act like you did once in the natural you now begin to act, if I can say, mimic your true father, who is right, who is truth, and is faith. Amen? And praise God for that. Amen? You see, this old nature is dead. This old character is dead. Hey, you no longer lie. Amen? Lying is dead. Amen? Uh, deceit is dead. Hallelujah. Amen. Selfishness. Selfishness in the moment. I'm talking about the moment. Is dead. Amen. Covetousness in that moment. Just think back to the moment when you were born again. Those things were dead. Amen. You didn't care. Uh, you know, that's probably sometimes what's good about having an older call and, 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 and you're made to come to the front. Amen, in itself a humiliating thing. Amen, especially if you have friends and so forth, uh, uh, or you're the toughie or whatever, and uh, amen, here you come down the front, you know, tears down your eye, blubbing away, and amen, it's a, it's, it's a humbling thing. Amen, because self is gone. Amen. Covetousness is gone. I, I like how Paul put, dealt with covetousness. He said this. He said, not that I speak in respect of want. Amen. For I have learnt in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. Amen. Therewith to be content. You see, Paul understood something very important. He understood that when you receive the kingdom, you take no thought. When you receive the kingdom, you take no thought. Sadly, what happens is, though, uh, as we progress and we become mature and we can handle things, we begin to take thought because we step ourselves outside of the kingdom. But when you're in the kingdom, you take no thought. Isn't that amazing? 
See, that's why you are truthful. That's why you are no longer a liar. That's why you no longer deceive. That is why you no longer covet. That's why you no longer concentrate and want to protect self because you take no thought in that moment. And I guarantee if you go back to the moment when you were born again, I mean, the hour to, to, to when you were born again, you took no thought. You took no thought about what was going to happen tomorrow. Amen. The, uh, what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6 became reality to you. Amen. That when you seek the kingdom and his righteousness, amen, that's what he told us to do. And then the next verse told us to take no thought. You take no thought because the kingdom has come. Amen. Of course, uh, sadly for many, uh, they just go down the road a little bit and they begin to take up all the thoughts again. Amen? And it's just how it is for many. But it need not be that it was not that way for Paul. He took no thought. Amen? He took no thought. Amen? Praise God. So we're dealing with true character, the character of God. Amen? Uh, before we do that, oh, well, no, we won't. We, we all know what it says in Matthew chapter 6, don't we? where we are warned uh, not to store our treasure on earth, but to store our treasure in heaven. Not to make treasure on earth, but to make treasure in heaven because uh, where your treasure is, your heart is. Amen? You know, when you were born again, you took no thought about any earthly treasure. You took no thought about what was going to happen the next day. You took no thought about what you were going to be doing in 10 years, 20 years, or 30 years' time. You made no provision. All you wanted was Jesus Christ. All you wanted was Him. All you wanted was the load taken off. I've written something on the board there that salvation is wrought in crises. Always. Nobody just becomes saved. Everybody's saved in a crisis. We're always saved in a moral or ethical dilemma. Amen. Something, it's like you come to a place where your cup is full. Amen. Your sin is overflowing. Amen. And in that moment, your heart is so pricked that you find yourself in a moral or ethical dilemma, a crisis. Amen. It's almost like you're at a stage in your life, a stage in your being that if you choose to ignore the dilemma, you become reprobate. Amen. And I mean that. I'm not a great fan of the second chance. Amen. The second chance just seems far too easy for me. Amen. You know, imagine, you know, being called. God calls you and say, look, God, uh, uh, I just want to spend a little bit more time drinking and, 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 and yahooing and, uh, you know, uh, womanizing and, uh, and, and so forth. Uh, I'll come when I'm good and ready, God. You, who believes God's going to give a second chance? You see, I, I'm not a strong fan of that one. Amen. I, I, I believe that, that when the King of Kings, uh, Lord of Lords, calls, uh, you better stand to attention uh, or uh, you're gone. <laughs> Amen. Uh, I just believe that. <laughs> so I'm not a great fan of deathbed confessions and all that kind of nonsense. Amen. I believe when you're born again, there's a new and living way to live. To live. Amen, or else God will plan it in such a way for you that you get saved and you drop dead. But God says you need to live it. You need to demonstrate it. He said, I saved you to be a witness unto me, a witness to the truth, a witness, amen, to righteousness, a witness to faith. That's what we uh, need to be, uh, I believe. Amen. What about Jonah, Pastor? What's wrong with Jonah? That was in the Old Testament, sis. He didn't have the Holy Spirit. But also, I want to make it clear 
that once you are born again, I'm talking about sinners. I'm talking about people who just rank sinners where they come to the point where the cup is full. And God calls them. God calls everybody. Amen. When, when, uh, when they come to the point that they are under conviction, it doesn't matter who they are, where they are, and where they're at. But I believe that God calls every single human being. Amen. Brings every human being to the place of decision, of choice. It may not be the way that we think it should be in a church or, you know, with us speaking, but uh, it might just be in their own room, in their own bed, in their own place. Amen. They come to this point in their hearts and minds where they're pondering and, and, and they're in that moral dilemma. Amen. And that crisis point in their lives. And at that point, they have a choice to make. They can either bow their knee to God, not even knowing who God is. It's not the point. When you were born again, you didn't really know who God was. You just knew that there was somebody bigger than you, somebody greater than you, that could give you wellness, could heal your broken heart. Amen? You know, the, the understanding of, of, of doctrines and so forth, that comes as we study and learn. You, you don't study to become saved. Uh, you know, some people are like that. Well, you know, I've got to see this book and you've got to show me this and show me that and, uh, you know, I want to see the proof of this. No, sorry, you, you've, you've, you've either gone beyond the crisis because you can't get saved that way. Amen. You have to come to a point of crises in your life. It's almost like you have to come to the point of seeing the cost, the price. And you're seeing what Jesus Christ has done for you. If you're going to value this treasure, you have to have a, have a knowing of its value. And people who want to study salvation never ever see the value. You know, oh, well, it makes, it makes logic to get saved. Rubbish. There's nothing to do with logic. Amen. Well, you know, look at the benefits. You know, I'll get saved because of the benefits. You'll get me a new car, new house, heal my body. No, 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 no. You've got it all wrong. It has nothing to do with those things. It's got to do with a heart full of sin. Amen. A heart, amen. A person who's going the wrong way. See, a lot of those people continue in the wrong way. True. See, if you're not born again in a crisis, I guarantee you will struggle. You're always struggling, always trying to find your way through, always trying to justify, always trying to, amen, trying to work it in such a way that, well, you know, I don't have to do this, I don't want to do that. Because the kingdom didn't come. Amen, uh, you know, you've got too many thoughts. Because Jesus said, when the kingdom comes, there is no thought. You take no thought for tomorrow. True? Amen? So, I just want to spend a little time this morning and see how I go. And I want to explain to you and show you how the divine nature works at salvation. Um, as I was traveling home from here last Sunday evening... Sister Eileen said to me, why didn't you share your testimony? And I said, I never thought about it. And, and uh, you know, you've all heard my testimony concerning how I got saved. But you never ever heard my testimony of what led to my salvation. And I want to share that with you this morning, just a little bit of it. Um, and, and I'll, I'll just make it very recent. Uh, I'm not going to go back to when I was in the womb. <laughs> Amen. Uh, Amen. I'm not going to go back to my blaming my parents. I'm just going back to the last uh, job I had working for somebody else. And that was a company called Structacom. It sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Structacom. And uh, this company that I worked for, um, we used to, well, we were a construction company, and we would build early education centers and preschools for the government. Uh, these were transportable buildings, uh, and we would build them all over the state. I was the construction manager. I was responsible for supervising the work. 
uh, I was responsible for uh, 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 finding subcontractors uh, and so forth. That, that was my job. Also part of my job was that I would personally go and uh, put the footings in for each single building. And that had advantages in those days because after we'd finished that task of, of digging footings and pouring concrete and so forth, uh, we would go for a holiday on the company. Um, and that was wonderful. Now, this company, Structacom, uh, was birthed out of another company that went broke. And, and, and so the guy who, who uh, was the builder and, and, and the guy who uh, decided to, that he would uh, start this new company uh, took the old contracts of the uh, company that went broke and the government supported him in that. But of course the one problem that uh, any new business has is uh, finances. Amen? Cash flow. And, and I'll explain to you what we actually did. Well, I'll explain to you now what we would do to get the job done. We started, and I began working with Structacom from its inception, and we started at the time, remember the great electricity strike? And um, under, it was under Bjelke Peterson. And um, at that time, because you know, there was so little power, the government uh, decided that all industrial use was banned. And uh, because we were a new company, uh, we were in financial strife, and we had to get this building out on site. And so what we did, what I did, the boss went home because he could not be involved in what we were doing. But what we did is we actually went back in the middle of the night, and we would start up our arc welders, and we would try and get the job ready to go out on site. We did so hoping that nobody would find out, and nobody did find out. And that's how we survived to start off with. It was probably better that we were found out at that stage. Uh, but anyway, that's what we, we just did what we needed to do to get the job done. And to hell with the law, so to speak. Um, also, as you know, and, and especially in the building industry, it has a bad reputation. Because generally people who run those kinds of businesses have no experience at running a good business. They believe that every single dollar that comes in is theirs. That's their mindset. They believe that every single dollar is theirs. And then they will decide what they, what they will do with it. And of course that's why you see building company after building company going broke because that's how it works. You see they start up and it's just a matter of maybe a month or two, six months and they're driving brand new cars, have brand new houses, uh, go on holidays and so forth. How's that possible? Well they're spending somebody else's money. That's what they're doing. And that's just how it is. That's how these guys operate. And eventually of course they end up going broke. Um, but uh, that's how this guy operated. Didn't take long before he had the house, the car, and, and so forth, and, and uh, we were all getting paid pretty good. But what was happening was, is we were taking our share from the top. Rather than in a good business, you take your share from the bottom, from the bottom line. That's how you run a good business. Amen? Because what's left is yours. Not what comes in is yours. And of course what happens is, uh, and it happens to virtually all businesses, there always comes a quiet time. And then what we began doing, we started to rob Peter to pay Paul. You know, uh, you get a job in, but that job takes care of the previous job. All right? And of course that just becomes a, a, a steady uh, downhill spiral. And of course, who's responsible for paying people, for employing people? Me. See, also what uh, we had, uh, one of our directors, I was, I was just working there, uh, he was a solicitor, operated very much like Clive does. The subcontractor took us to court for payment, he would counter uh, suit them or counter claim them. Of course, just a stalling tactic, that's all that is. And, and, and so that's what we would be doing. So let me just come now to the last week that I was working with them. 
And what actually happened is, is the boss decided to get married. And uh, he went um, to, I think it was Lizard Island, or one of those islands way up on the Barrier Reef there, one of those expensive ones where, was it Lizard Island? Yeah, where you pay an arm and two legs. Uh, that's where he went. Now, we didn't have two dollars to rub together. All right, we were conning people left, right, and centre to try and get jobs done. That's what we did. That's what I did. I would employ, uh, sign up subcontractors to get jobs done, knowing full well that they would not get paid. All right, or if they did get paid, certainly not what they signed up for. So I was building uh, uh, this, this, uh, this, this uh, preschool down on the south side of Brisbane. And uh, we needed to get some trusses for this building. And so I come into the office and uh, you know, I said, hey, we, you know, because we, suppliers, we, there are very few would deal with us, so we generally had to pay cash. And I says, look, you've got to write me a check. And I told him to the guy in the office, you've got to write me a check so I can go and order the trusses. And he said, I can't. I says, why can't you? Well, he said, well, because the boss... He cleaned the account out. He took out $10,000 out of the company account to pay for his honeymoon. And of course, that is when I began to boil. <laughs> and that's when I came to a situation where a crisis began to take place. Um, I didn't know how the crisis was was actually working at the time. Um, I continued during the week, and I believe that, from my memory, we found somebody that we could con into supplying us trusses, but already something was working in me. Amen? So, we came to the Friday, came to Saturday, came to the Sunday. I just want to give you the background of what is going on. I'm just a crook. Amen? And knowing full well what we're doing. But yet something was working in me. My cup was getting full. And then, of course, you know the story that on the Sunday morning and then on the Sunday evening, I find myself in a church. And I find myself giving my heart to the Lord, receiving Jesus Christ. Unbeknownst to me that that was going to, how my life was going to work out during that week. At that moment, brothers and sisters, I received and was made a partaker of the divine nature. At that moment, my sins were washed away. Amen. At that moment, I was made pure. Amen. On the Monday morning, I went back to work. And on that Monday morning, I threw in the towel. I took no thought for tomorrow. Hear me. I took no thought about what I was going to do. I took no thought how the family was going to survive. I just did what my nature made me to do. That's the divine nature. That's what you become a partaker of when you are born again. You take no thought. Hear me. Amen? You take no thought. Now, let me go on. When you are born again, at that very moment when I was saved, God filled me with truth. God filled me with righteousness. God filled me with faith. And I had no idea what those things were. But what God did do for me is he put in me no thought. No thought. Why? How? Well, because the kingdom came. Because when the kingdom comes, according to Jesus Christ, you take no thought for tomorrow. You let tomorrow take care of itself because you, know, you no longer act 
in your old nature, in the old Gentile nature, you now walk in your new nature. Amen? And it's an instant change. You don't grow into truth. If some people think, well, you know, I'm trying my best. I'll become truthful in time. You know, uh, I'm trying to be faithful. You can't grow into these things. You can't grow into truth. You're one or the other. I mean, you can't grow out of deception. You either are a deceiver or you are not. You can't grow into faith. You're either faithful or you are not. Amen? <laughs> That's how it is. <laughs> Amen? Amen? You see, when you are born again, you don't try and justify yourself. I didn't. Amen? We, we, we uh, don't overthink things. I didn't. I, I mean, I did not think about what I was going to do. You do not overthink things. You don't look for the loopholes. You, you, you certainly don't find people to agree with what you want to do. You take no thought. Amen? No thought. In other words, at that moment when you were born again, you do right. I'm not talking about what you might be doing now. I'm talking about what you were when you got saved. At that moment and in that time, God made you a partaker of his nature. And at that point, you were made right. You were made truth. You were made faith. You were. Amen? And truth be known, and you go back, if you can remember, to that very moment, you took no thought. And if you did take thought, if you did try and weigh it up, the kingdom never came. But when the kingdom comes, the sign of the kingdom is this, no thought. I do right. I am truth. Amen. I am faith. Does it make sense to you? Amen. Now, it's wonderful being where I am today because I can look back from that moment on. <laughs> Amen. From that no thought decision on. See what happens is see, many of you are too busy weighing things up. And that's why when you look back in 10 years, 15 years, you will be very disappointed. Amen? You may think it's the right decision now because you've weighed it up. But I want to tell you that in 10 years, 15 years, you'll look back and say, boy, that was a bad, that was my decision. Why? Because you took thought. Amen? You forsook the kingdom. And you went out on your own. Amen? The best decision you make is when you are born again. Because at that moment, you make decisions that are of no thought. And why can you do that? Because you are now walking in the truth, the way, and the life. Isn't that right? Now, I can look back now over time And probably, at the time it was grim. The decision that I made, no job. Going broke. House about to be repossessed. I mean that. I mean, we had some character who wanted to buy our house for the cost of the mortgage. Because we knew the bank was knocking on the door. And God gave us a sign to keep the house. And I believe that. Amen. In fact, it was so odd is, is that we were being chased by the Westpac Bank. And for some reason, another branch of the Westpac Bank helped us out. How's that? Amen. Took all our, all, all our non-payments 
and saying, hey, let's just start from scratch. But I want to tell you that at the time, it looked grim. Amen? But when I look back now, I see the adventures. I see Africa. Amen? I'm here today because I took no thought. You see, that last week at Structicon, man, I was at a point where there really was no hope. It was grim then too because I knew full well that this company's not going to survive. Yeah, I wonder sometimes what I would be if I had not gone to have my overflowing cup emptied out. I do, I wonder sometimes, amen, maybe a drunkard, who knows? Certainly I wouldn't have had any family. Probably still a crook, still trying to deceive people. Who, who, who knows? Amen. Certainly there would have been no design business. Would not have happened. Because that was by the hand of God. I know that. And to my knowledge, that business still gives from the gross. Amen. <laughs> Doesn't give from the bottom line. Gives from the top line. Hallelujah, somebody. Amen. Hey, take no thought. You know what? If I'd have not gone to get my cup emptied out, there would have been no Paul, I'm sure, no Heidi, and certainly not one of you. Amen, somebody. Amen. Well, this is all because of no thought. I'm talking about what is this divine nature? What does it do for us? Well, in the first instant, it may not do much. It may look like a bad thing. But oh, you give it some time. You give it some time. Amen. It's like putting a seed in the ground. Amen. Well, you know, as Jesus you know, taught us, he said, you know, you put the little seed in the ground, that little mustard seed, he said, and it grows like a tree. No thought. This is a testimony of the character of God, the true character of God. Amen. Where you take no thought, you're not trying to build your kingdom. Amen. You want God to work for you. You want him to be your father. Amen. I just think how God has blessed me with his nature. I truly, it is a blessing. Amen. It is a blessing. Amen. The adventures that he has given me. And I, you know, I think of adventure of some of the things that we have done together. And then, you know, some of the things we've done in Africa. What an adventure. Some of the things that have happened within our own family. What an adventure. Things that would have never have happened, never have taken place, except for no thought. And let me tell you, let me tell you, this is important, that this no thought was not a thought. It was just so. Because when the kingdom comes, there is no thought. When the kingdom comes, you trust God. When the kingdom comes, you're no longer a Gentile. You're no longer in the old nature. Now you walk in the new nature. And the new nature says that God will care. Well, maybe not tomorrow in the way you expect. 
in His timing, in His ways. You know, when I first started off in ministry, you know, I thought, man, we just become mega huge. And it's true, wasn't it? Amen. That was, that we're just going to do so many things. And but of course, truth seems to whittle things down. <laughs> Amen. A lot of people don't want to take what we say. Certainly would, would, would not enjoy this morning's message. Because they're always taking, always weighing things up. Amen. You see, here. The new life never calculates. Never calculates. And see, that's what a lot of people do. Some of you may even do that. Calculate. What's it going to cost me to be truthful? That's the problem, isn't it? I mean, you, 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 the kingdom hasn't come yet. You see, we are not called to calculate. We are called to live the life. True? And you see, if you've never had this crisis that I'm talking about, this moral crisis, this ethical crisis, I don't think you understand. You don't understand what I'm saying. And you need to get right. Amen? Because I guarantee that if you are making your choices to fulfill your tomorrow's thoughts, you're going to look back at 10 years, 15 years, and you're going to look back down the line and you're not going to be happy. It will not have been the adventure you thought it might have been. True? And I'm just amazed what, what a few years can do. I mean, and I do realize that when you're living in the moment at that present time, it does, it's difficult, it's hard. I mean, it's not easy. If you find yourself in situations where you don't have work, don't have money, don't have anything, everything's in trouble, there's peril everywhere. But somebody read something out about peril this morning, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, but I've got a plan. I've got a plan for tomorrow. I've got a plan for tomorrow. I've got to, you know, I've got to make sure I've got dollars in the bank. I've got to, that's your problem. You don't. You just got to do the right thing. Live the truth. Be truthful. And if that costs you, praise God. Because you're going to look back in 10 years' time at that truth and you'll look back and say, my, what an adventure. Look how God has blessed me. You're not going to worry about, you know, that $100,000 deal you lost. Amen? I mean that. You won't, I mean, it's hard at the time. <laughs> but when you look back over time, it was just a drop in the bucket. It's all about where your treasure is, isn't it? Amen? Amen. You see, we have so many who claim to be Christians who won't make a right choice concerning friends. Won't make a right choice concerning being honest in business. Won't make a right cho choice concerning attending the congregational meetings. Won't make the right choice concerning even the jobs they take. Amen. Somebody say amen. There are some things we cannot do. It's as simple as that. Amen. And then they wonder why there is no blessing in their life. They wonder why when they look back over their lives, everything is by their own hands. You know, do not make a mistake. That which is by your hand is by your hand. Don't you say that's God's blessing? Amen? I'm talking about what the Father has given you. That's blessing. Amen? If you're just, if everything that you accrue and everything you have is by your own hand, then you're no different to the Gentiles. Isn't that true? Where's the hand of God in that? Do you know 
what I find amazing, so some, of the, some, some of the things that, that you might find ordinary, I find miraculous. I really do. <clears throat> many years ago, many, many years ago, the same company that got us out of our situation, out of our situation, remember, we were broke, uh, we were losing our house, no work, no nothing. It was that very company that helped me and us get started with our design business. That same company, the same company that helped Angie out a few weeks ago. Now tell me it's not the hand of God. You heard her testimony. You know, we, we all go, ah, when, you know, somebody sends you a thousand dollars in the post. You know how some of these Pentecostals rave on? Well, you know, I just opened up a letterbox and there was $10,000 in my letterbox. And I just take that all with a grain of salt. But when I hear this and this, I say, there's the hand of God. Amen? Take no thought. Amen. The true character of God is take no thought. Receive the kingdom. As many as received him. Who? The kingdom. <coughs> as many as received him gave he power. Power. What is this power? No thought. Right. Truth. Faith. To become the sons of God. And when I think of that, I mean to be able to stand as a true witness, I mean to Jesus Christ. I mean to have, to have a testimony that says, I am a partaker of the divine nature. A am I making sense this morning? You see, being a born again Christian is not a badge to be worn. Amen. Remember a few years ago, everybody who was a Pentecostal had a little fish on their car. Amen. That, that proves I'm a Christian. Look at that little fish. Amen. Remember that? Amen. <laughs> but I want to tell you that being a Christian is not words on your lips. It's a life you live. Amen. Let us never, ever forget that. Amen. Amen? It just does right. It just does right. This new life just does right. Why? Because it has become a partaker of the divine nature. It doesn't do wrong. It just does right. Amen? Amen. Now I'll get back to the Beatitudes maybe next week. But I want us to go to Psalm 51. Because I don't know where you're at. But I would suspect some have David's problem. And you need a restoration of the right spirit. Amen? You need to get back on the bike. But you can't get back unless you get right. That's why, you know, uh, try and remember the moment when you were born again. That's how you are to be. Amen? The problem is that after we get saved, a while we become sophisticated, knowledgeable. We think we can handle this and handle that. Amen? You know, uh, we can, uh, you know, let things slide. Who knows that? We can let our morals slide. I mean, we can begin to accept things even in, I mean, in our own family that we know is wrong and just let it slide. And I guarantee you, when you let things slide, I mean, greater moral dilemmas and ethical dilemmas will come your way as God's no fool. Don't think you can fool him. I mean, he's just going to make life even harder for you. It's what he does. Because he loves you, wants you back. I mean, he's going to put something else in front of you. Well, what are you going to do about this? Let it slide? Huh? What are you going to do about this? Ah, oh, yeah, but it's part of my job. Well, you're in the wrong job. Get out of it. 
Get out of it. Run for your life. Be like Joseph, run for your life. Amen? Oh, yeah, but it's part, of the, it's part of my business. Get out of the business. Sell it. Get rid of it. Because you must do right. You cannot afford to do wrong. Because then you pick up the old nature again. And I don't know about you, have you ever noticed that if you do wrong, it just becomes more wrong and more wrong and more wrong? Well, the kingdom's gone. Thought begins to take over. It's just how it is. God says, take no thought. You know, if I had time, we could go to, to Matthew chapter 6 and read it. God says, don't take thought. When the kingdom comes, there is no thought. He's, he's, you know, do the birds worry? Do they take thought about where the next seed is? Uh uh, they don't. God says, I take care of them. <laughs> How much more will I take care of my children? Those who are bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Amen? It might not be, uh, you, you might not be a millionaire the next day. <laughs> But you give it some time when you have opportunity to look back over time. And you begin to see God working and working and working and working and working and working. And I'll tell you what, you wouldn't swap it for a million dollars. <laughs> Amen? Wouldn't swap it for a million dollars. Psalm 51. It's in here somewhere. Maybe, um, can you read it for us, Sister Linda? We'll just go from 1 to maybe 12. Hey, so notice how David, we all know that David had, had committed a gross sin, been very deceitful, and, and know how he approaches God. <laughs> yeah, it's almost like he's trying to butter God up, isn't it? Do you notice that? Hey Amen. And, and is, you know, I don't know, when you were little and you'd done something wrong and you went to your dad or your mum and all right, you just wanted to spin a good, oh, I love your mum. <laughs> Especially when she was holding this, this beater thing that she used to beat the carpets with. Oh, I love you, Mum. <laughs> yeah, let's do it again. He knew something about God, didn't he? That there's always hope in God. Yes. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Maybe that's your prayer for this day, that God might restore the joy that you received in salvation. Amen? What is that? Well, go back. Go back. Amen? Go back to the time 
the place. Amen? You can't figure out how. I don't know how God did it, but I do know something that in that moment, in that moment, I changed from being untruthful to the truth, from being unrighteous to righteous. Man, by being faithless to faithful, in that very moment, the kingdom came. Amen. I'm going to ask uh, Sister Heidi to come. Hey, remember that song, Create in Me? That's the one. That's David's song. Amen. And then as we close this morning, maybe one or two of you may have had a similar testimony. I just want to give you a moment or two, if you'd like, to share. Yeah.